Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, the next lecture in my Life in the Universe pandemic series. I hope you're all taking care of yourself and uh, getting plenty of food and, and fresh air. This evening's talk, we're going to be joined by a very special guest whose name is Europa. And Europa is a leopard gecko. And the question we're going to be asking this evening is why didn't the dinosaurs build a space program. Now that may seem like a very strange question. I'm sure Europa would think that was a very, very odd question indeed. But the reason why it is an interesting question and not quite so crazy as it sounds is that the dinosaurs were around for a very, very long time. Europa is a reptile. She's actually not a descendant of the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs were a separate lineage to uh, the ancestors of, of modern reptiles. Uh, but she has, her family has been around for a long time. Geckos have been found from 100 million years ago. And so uh, Europa's great, 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 great grandmother going back into the Cretaceous would have been sitting on a tree looking much like Europa, watching Tyrannosaurus rex walking around in the forest. So I think you can agree that's a rather impressive and illustrious uh, family pedigree. So here's the question. Um, human beings in our modern form Homo sapiens, our, our species, human species, has been around for about 300,000 years or thereabouts. And we've gone in that time from a fairly primitive um, group of, of, of uh, hunter-gatherers, humans living in caves, through to a species um, that has landed humans on the moon in the space of 300,000 years. And in fact, if we go back even further and not so much further, about two or three million years, uh, our ancestors were the chimpanzees. So in a very in a very short period of time, we've gone from um, primitive um, chimpanzees through to a spacefaring civilization. And yet the dinosaurs uh, retained mastery of the air, land and sea for over 160 million years. 160 million years, that's 500 times longer than the human species has been around. And yet no sign of a dinosaur space program, no sign of any high civilization amongst the dinosaurs and Europa can attest to the fact that the dinosaurs had no civilization. So the question Europa is asking here is if dinosaurs were around for 160 million years or longer and her great ancestors saw the dinosaurs, why didn't they build uh, a space program? Why didn't they emerge into intelligence? And that's a very interesting question because some people have suggested that had the dinosaurs not gone extinct, they indeed would have moved on towards high intelligence. And one of the most interesting speculations in this regard was, um, was put forward by Dale Russell, who was a curator of vertebrate paleontology at the National Museum of Canada in Ottawa. And he discovered the skull of a rather intriguing dinosaur called the Troodontids. And it was a skull that contained rather a large brain in relation to the body size of the creature that, um, that possessed it. And one way in which you can measure brain size in any creature is by measuring the encephalization quotient. And the encephalization quotient is a measure of the size of your brain in relation to your body size compared to other creatures of similar body mass. So for example, in human beings, our encephalization quotient is about seven. And that reflects the fact that our brains are very big uh, in proportion to our bodies compared to other creatures of the same sort of mass as us. And that broadly correlates with our intelligence. Our large brains, our great cognitive capacity, uh, leads to this high encephalization quotient. Uh, most creatures have encephalization quotients, or mammals have encephalization quotients of between uh, one and three, quite low values. Their brains are quite small uh, in relation to their body mass. So encephalization quotient isn't a measure of intelligence, but it does broadly reflect uh, the, the size of one's brain and therefore the likely cognitive capacity. Anyway, getting back to Dale Russell, he went exploring dinosaurs when he was um, uh, curator of uh, vertebrate paleontology at the National Museum of Canada. And he discovered the skull of this troodontid dinosaur. And it turns out that the encephalization quotient, or at least the size of the skull in relation to the body size of this dinosaur, was about five which is quite high, much higher than a Diplodocus, for example, that had an encephalization quotient of something around two or so. In other words, most dinosaurs did not seem to be very bright. 
But the troodontid was interesting because not only did it have this high, um, this large brain cavity size in relation to its body mass, it was also bipedal, it ran around on its two feet, and it had a mass of about 75, 80 kilograms, not unlike us. And Dale Russell speculated that maybe uh, had the dinosaur had longer to evolve, maybe the troodontids would have uh, increased their brain size and become even uh, more intelligent, and ultimately dinosaur intelligence would have evolved. Of course, that doesn't still answer our question, uh, why did it even take 160 million years or so to reach that point? And even if they had become intelligent, why so long? And the answer to that is we actually don't really know. Lots of people seem to have interesting ideas about why human beings uh, became intelligent. Some people have suggested that when we moved out of the forests into the savannah, um, that forced upon us the need for intelligence to escape predators and to run around the savannah catching uh, prey for our dinner, and that made our brains get larger. But you could equally argue, surely in 160 million years of dinosaur evolution, there must have been a few species of dinosaur that were forced out of forests into plains. So surely there have been previous instances of creatures that had to move out of forests into plains and therefore uh, chase after their prey and develop large brains. It doesn't seem like that is particularly specific to um, human uh, ancestors. Other people have suggested that as humanity evolved in its early history, um, we tended to gather around campfires and that made us very social creatures. And as we gathered around a campfire, we communicated with each other, maybe in grunts, but because we needed to um, convey information, that had a selection pressure for making our brains larger. Our language centers became more sophisticated, and as language became more sophisticated, so the brains needed to process that information grew as well. But I guess you could say, equally, there were plenty of dinosaurs that ran around in herds, in groups of dinosaurs. Why didn't they settle down one evening around a campfire and, and start communicating with each other and uh, developing cognitive capacities and linguistic skills like humans? Is it really the case that socialization in humans uh, was unique to our species. So there's lots of interesting ideas out there. I don't have an answer to it, and I'm not sure anyone else really has a convincing answer to it either, although people have their pet theories. It remains a bit of a mystery as to why uh, human beings developed intelligence and went from fairly primitive state to building spacecraft in such a short time, and yet the dinosaurs failed to uh, achieve this high intelligence. Unfortunately, uh, the dinosaur, the reign of the dinosaurs, uh, ended rather quickly, about 66 million years ago, with the collision of an asteroid impact. But it's important to point out that dinosaurs did not go completely extinct. You'll often hear people say, and textbooks will say, the dinosaurs went extinct uh, about 65, 66 million years ago. But that's not completely true, because there are dinosaurs on the Earth today. Birds are the uh, living descendants of dinosaurs. Uh, they are the winged uh, descendants of dinosaurs. And there are about 10,000 species of birds on the planet today. So just think about that. We actually live on a planet with 10,000 species of dinosaurs. So most of the non-avian dinosaurs, the non-flying dinosaurs, did go extinct uh, that 66 million years ago. But some of them are alive today. Next time you eat a chicken sandwich, just think about the fact that you're actually eating a dinosaur sandwich. So how did the dinosaurs meet their fate? Why, uh, even if they had um, been on a trajectory to intelligence, why was that ended? Well, we think that the major cause of the extinction of the dinosaurs was an asteroid impact. And in the 1980s, uh, Walter Alvarez and his son at the University of California, Berkeley, studied the, ge the geological transition at the uh, cretaceous Paleogene uh, boundary, where the asteroid impact occurred. And what they found is that at that very thin boundary where the catastrophe occurred that ended the dinosaurs, there's an increase in the element iridium, which is a rather unusual element. Um, you can find iridium deep in the Earth, but the other place you can find iridium is in asteroids. And the high concentrations of iridium, uh, several parts per billion at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, are testament to an asteroid colliding with the Earth and lofting vast quantities of dust into the atmosphere blocking out sunlight, killing the plants, and ending photosynthesis. So there was no food around. There was no plants around for the herbivores to eat, and the herbivores died, and the carnivores that ate the herbivores also died. In other words, 
the whole food web of the earth essentially collapsed. Not everything died, the crocodiles got through, the birds got through, that's why we still have dinosaurs on the earth today. And of course many deep sea creatures survived. Uh, many things that like to burrow and can eat roots or seeds also survived. But vast numbers of organisms died, about 75% uh, of the earth's animals perished at the end of the Cretaceous. And little Europa here and her ancestors also survived to make it through to the present day. Here she is, a testament to the survival of the reptiles. Some people are rather skeptical about the asteroid impact um, hypothesis. If you tell people about that on the street, they think oh, you, can't be, you can't be being serious. An asteroid impact, that's outlandish. But there's much other evidence for um, an asteroid impact at the Cretaceous boundary. She, she gets a little bit, oh, she gets a little bit tetchy when we talk about the extinction of the dinosaurs, makes her a little bit um, restless because she doesn't really like to remember that. So um, she's going a little bit, a little bit, a little bit concerned. But anyway, it's not gonna happen again, Europa, not today anyway. So the extinction of the dinosaurs um, by an asteroid impact has much other evidence as well. Um, for example, at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, as well as the iridium, uh, we also find uh, tectites, which are tiny spherical pieces of glass that are made when molten rock was ejected into the Earth's atmosphere. And like rain droplets dropping from a cloud, that molten glass formed spheres. And those spheres landed on the Earth. And that is evidence of vast quantities of volcanic rock being ejected into the atmosphere and transported across the Earth and landing in different places on the Earth. We also find shocked quartz. So quartz is a type of mineral, and if you, if you hit it with an asteroid and you subject it to extreme pressures, that quartz will get lots of little lines in it, planar deformation features they're called. And at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, we find lots of quartz with planar deformation features. Again, evidence of massive pressures caused by an asteroid impact. Other intriguing things as well, a reduction in the number of spores at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary that is evidence for the uh, destruction of trees and forests producing pollen um, and, and, uh, and pollen in the, in the Cretaceous uh, paleogene uh, boundary. So all of these things are evidence for um, a, a catastrophe at the end of the Cretaceous that ended the, the empire of the dinosaurs and about 75% of other animals as well. And with the end of the dinosaurs came the end of the possibility of intelligent dinosaurs. But nevertheless, it still remains a mystery. Why did dinosaurs continue for 160 million years without any sign of intelligence or high civilization? And yet our own species has emerged from its own lineage uh, rather quickly. The mammals uh, emerged after the dinosaurs vacated many, many of the ecological niches. At the end of the Cretaceous, the mammals took over and in, in the space of 65 million years, we went from tiny little shrews to spaceship uh, building intelligence. And the answer has to be buried in there, somewhere in the history of evolution. What is it that drives intelligence? What are the selection uh, pressures that make for large brains and intelligence? And we don't really know the answer to that, but it remains a fascinating question. So the question, why didn't dinosaurs set up a space program it's not so crazy after all, because buried in that question are fundamental questions about the inevitability of intelligence in the universe. Would we find intelligence on other planets, or was it extremely rare? If the dinosaurs never achieved intelligence after 160 million years, maybe it's a rare event and our own intelligence is a one-off and it would never happen elsewhere in the universe. So we don't really know whether that's the case or not. Maybe the dinosaurs just had some bad luck. And in fact, if you re-ran evolution, intelligence would evolve many times very quickly. The dinosaurs, just for some reason, were a lineage of organisms that never developed intelligence. These are fascinating questions. They're very difficult to answer. We can't really um, answer these questions until we know more about evolution. But one thing we can say is that intelligence has had a profound impact on our planet. And little Europa here, her ancestors once saw the dinosaurs on the earth and she survived, her lineage survived through to the modern reptiles. So she's going a bit crazy now because she doesn't like talking about the extinction of the dinosaurs. It makes her extremely um, uneasy and rather tetchy because buried in that reptile brain is maybe a little bit of a memory of 
um, the end of the reptiles. So thank you very much for joining me on this uh, tour of uh, reptile intelligence. This is the end of this lecture in Life in the Universe in the Pandemic series. Uh, look after yourselves, uh, avoid the virus if you've got the virus. I hope you're recovering very quickly and we'll talk more about um, some of the interesting questions in astrobiology in future lectures. Thank you very much. Good evening.